Hi, my name is Matthew Tairogamba and I'm an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific and economic renewal is here and with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Matthew Rugamba is a foremost Rwandan fashion designer. His brand, House of Tire, was founded in 2011 and created out of the desire to find a unique way to showcase African sophistication, style and flavor through contemporary locally made clothing and accessories with style influences ranging from the Motown era to traditional British tailoring they seek to combine elegance and class with a strong sense of African heritage and iconography described as a distinctly Rwandan born brand that works with local artisans and tailors they support the local community by providing stable income and employment opportunities. With its unconventional combination of colors and patterns, the brand is bold and futuristic, edgy yet sophisticated and reflective of the current proliferation of African arts, culture and style on the world stage. The brand is truly authentic and homegrown, utilizing African textiles and fabrics and produced by Rwandan tailors and artisans. Matthew is the CEO at House of Tayo. All right, welcome to Under 40 CEOs, Matthew. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, amazing. I like how your website describes your brand, yes. a Rwandan-born African. Yes. Now, tell me about being born in London and yes. your fondest childhood memories. Um, I guess one of my fondest childhood memories was uh, getting my first Manchester United jersey. Oof. And that was... Uh, <laughs> It was a friend of, friend of mine uh, that I'd known for a couple of years and I never used to really watch football, I used to play. Mm. Gave me a jersey, converted me, and I've been a United fan for life. Amazing. Uh, but aside from that, it has been... Um, actually, when I moved from London to Uganda, um, there weren't that many stores to buy kids' clothing. So my mom would uh, take me to the fabric store, uh, buy some fabric, she'd ask my opinion, and this is when I was about like seven, eight, and then... Um, would find a tailor and the tailor would put together my outfits. So my first Holy Communion, my confirmation, um, some Christmas outfits were made by tailors. And I never realized how much that would impact me like 20 years later. Hmm. Yeah. Amazing. So um, you were in London for a bit and then you yeah. moved back to the, Africa. The, yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah. I moved to Uganda and then hmm. uh, went to boarding schools in um, Kenya and Swaziland. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I actually did uh, a short stint in, um, in London again. It was actually my first job um, selling toys. <laughs> and, and How old were you then? I was 18. So okay. I was demonstrating toys at Hamleys, Harrods, and Selfridges. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know off camera we're talking and you said, oh, you never really studied this uh, professionally. Yes. But then you went to university. What did you yeah. read? So I, I studied international relations and um, during my time doing that, I realized how many people had misconceptions of Africa. And I mean, it's one thing for someone on the streets to have a certain view of Africa, but when you're engaging in, uh, with, this other, with your peers who are studying international relations and still have such a, uh, you know, a limited view of, of what the, the rest of Africa is like, then um, I realized those problems. And so I wanted to change perceptions. And I, then the way I decided to do that was through uh, starting a clothing brand. All right. So what university was that that you attended? I went to Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. Amazing. Yeah. So tell me, uh, I've seen quite a lot on yes. the internet, yes. you and, you know, um, there's the collective that you put together. Yes, yes. Um, tell me a little bit about that. And okay. uh, also, what's your vision? for the Rwandan fashion industry. Okay. We started the collective, Collective RW in 2015, and it came out of a necessity to really, uh, we needed to grow the industry. We couldn't selfishly look at our own individual brands because 
there was a limit to how, much, how far we could go individually. We needed to be able to affect policy. We needed to be able to, uh, you know, encourage, um, you know, investment into the sector. And that can only happen when you're working united as a group. Mm. So since then, we've, you know, we've been doing, we've done three fashion weeks. Um, and then we do uh, different programs uh, um, outside of the fashion weeks. Um, one of our designers is going to be at, um, at London Fashion Week next year. Um, nice. And so, so that is something that we're really excited about and we really push each other to, to do better, to have better retail spaces, to produce better quality clothing. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that, you know, policy has started responding to what we envision, you know. And so that's why, there's a, you know, there's a Made in Rwanda campaign that is really uh, giving up businesses like ours a, a boost, and that's coming from government. Uh, private sector uh, uh, is now looking into how do we work with, with these entrepreneurs, how do we boost Made in Rwanda. Matthew Indid has bigger aspirations beyond building his fashion brand and business, but in building the industry as a whole in Rwanda. His outlook suggests that he must have influences from the West where he was raised. Who would you say are your role models uh, within the fashion space? Um, I have a couple. I, you know, I really looked. Uh, number one is Oswald Boateng. Um, I came across his work when I just started um, uh, designing product, and I was, I was trying to look for s someone who did something, who did what I wanted to do. And it's the first time I, I watched his documentary. Um, uh, and, and then I watched a bunch of interviews. I actually went to his store and I was so shy when I actually got to the store in Savile Row that I stepped in for a couple of seconds and walked out. So <laughs> I was really excited um, when I finally met him last year mm. and you know, got to sit down and he talked me through his process, um, how he started and really you know, his struggles, where he excelled, what he plans to do. And I, so he's, he's my number one idol. But then when I look at other people like Ralph Lauren, um, the way he's been able to build um, a huge brand that I mean, many people don't realize Ralph Lauren even sells paint now. Mm. They're selling cologne, they're mm -hmm. selling paint, he's selling a lifestyle. Uh -huh. And uh, I really want to build House of Tire into a lifestyle brand. I want to be able to do books, I want to be able to do movies. Um, that, uh, you know, maybe even uh, executive produce music albums, but really deliver like a lifestyle, you know, the contemporary African man. All right, which is amazing because um, Oswald and I were just chatting a few weeks ago yes. at a forum uh, yes. in Riyadh, and uh, we're talking about how creativity has no limits. Yes, that was actually uh, our topic of discussion. But in 2018, yes. um, Hollywood got a taste of Tayo. Yes, um, yes. when uh, Peter Nyongo, that's Lupita Nyongo's uh, brother, yes. wore your outfit to yes. the premiere, the Los Angeles premiere yes. of Black Panther. Now, tell me, how important? Was that moment to you? I, I, it was huge. It um, just, just in terms of numbers, our following went from like six thousand to twelve thousand in the space of a week. Wow. Um, so, and um, even for our local, the local consumers, they came back to our store and saying, "Now we understand um, why we should invest in designers like you, why we should buy your products." We see that if you're given um, the platform or the vote of confidence, you can take things even further. So that was really touching and, and it, it gave me that you know, extra energy. Um, but on top of that, just looking at it financially, it, people started to see themselves wearing locally made products. And that is huge. You can't mm -hmm. get... Um, Black Panther was huge for that mind shift. Mm -hmm. You know, you have many people... Um, I was speaking particularly, let's say, in East Africa, um, when they were not wearing locally made uh, clothing um, outside of the stuff you order with your tailor, but that wasn't really a thing. And so movies like Black Panther are really important in that culture shift. Mm. Amazing. So tell me about um, those major hurdles and challenges mm. um, that you've had to overcome to make the strides that you've made so far. Mm. 
Uh, I would say the key thing is, is really uh, respect. And respect affects so many parts of my business. Um, when I started, uh, I remember going to a bank and I wanted a point of sale machine so I could take card payments. I just started this shop. I only had like one table, but I knew that I needed to be cashless if I wanted to expand the number of products I sell. Um, and I went back first week, second week, third week, fourth week. And I said, listen, I have opened four bank accounts with you. I am trying to bring more money into the bank. Why can't you give me this uh, card machine? And they said, well, you see, uh, we don't think a tailor can make money. We don't think a tailor can make money. And so the only way we're going to give it to you is if, we rent it, if you rent it for about like $50 a month and then charging like 3.5%. So just because of their perception of, of tailing and fashion, I was going to be ripped off. So that perception and, and respect was a very um, important thing that I realized I had to build for my business to go further in any regard, you know. I had to, to gain respect for our industry, not just my business. Um, and the second thing is always is like financially, you know, you're looking at for fashion, you need significant investment. And um, what I've been doing now is really growing the brand and setting the groundwork for that major investment, which will probably have to come from outside uh, of the country. Um, you know, in the situations where there is money, the terms are, are ridiculous. You won't be able to survive past two years. Um, and then it's also just um, looking at creating jobs and um, you know, bringing in machinery. That takes a lot of time, money, and, and those are things that are, are still not there yet. All right, so what would you say um, makes the Rwandan uh, business landscape unique? I'd say our, our leaders listen. I think that's, that's number one. They listen and they respond, and they respond quick. Um, so we are landlocked. Um, there's so many things that should be going against us, but uh, we have a government that works that you can go to. I mean, first of all, you can set up a business here in, in, uh, in like six hours just to register and everything without having to pay people behind the, your back, you know, your back. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the important thing. You, you just have to do your homework, know who your market is, um, and realize that our government is there to, to, to really support. Granted, you, you also provide numbers to show what impact. Amazing. So um, what is the current business structure um, of your firm? Currently, I'm, I wear many hats, um, as most entrepreneurs do. I'm the CEO, founder, uh, creative director, and uh, then I have a team of assistants who also learned how to to multitask, they all take on different roles, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of production and then in the store, man, uh, being, managing the store. Um, and then I have a team of tailors, but we also outsource, um, we work with different cooperatives and workshops. For, for example, there's a women's cooperative that does all our accessories. Yeah, going into the new year, we're looking at really ex ex growing our team, um, hiring and, and, and specializing and, you know, communications and 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 the store itself and the production team for business that is gaining critical acclaim in Hollywood to being accepted as a viable investment opportunity in Rwanda scaling business hurdles in Rwanda must mean that Matthew has learned key business lessons so what are the most critical lessons uh, that you've learned and can share about running a business to profitability Oof, uh, number one, I think, would be to, to be able to, to change, you know, your, your direction, realize what went wrong and just pivot. Um, I think that that's most important. You know, you, we've had losses, we've had things that didn't go right, but I think where our strength has been is just saying, okay, this has happened, this is in the past, we've learned from this, what do we need to do to adapt? And I think that that's key, especially when you look at the way business in the world changes, I feel like every couple of months. Mm. And um, 
you need to, even when you're building your business structure, it needs to be one that is agile, that can adapt. You, you don't want to build a multi-million dollar business and then suddenly people are only buying products in a certain way and you collapse. You need to be a bit more flexible. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've lived in the United Kingdom, the United States, Uganda, Nairobi, uh, that's in Kenya, and yeah. of course you're back here in Rwanda. Yes. Very well traveled, I must say. <laughs> but how has, how has travel and interacting with different yes. cultures um, helped to shape your person and impacted your business? It's had a huge impact on my personality, my life, and, and the way I do business. It's, it's, it's also given me more, more empathy because, you know, you have to adapt so much. And I think that's why I'm building a business structure that can adapt. You know, you go into a different, you know, where they're speaking a different language, or diff there are different elements of culture. How do you blend in without, how do you, no, I, I think not blend, blend in is the wrong word because I don't want to just, you know, blend Blended. into my surroundings. Um, I want to have uh, my sense of self, my um, identity, and find ways of sharing it without imposing myself too much. Mm. So that's been very important for me. All right. So, I mean, you've received a lot of nods, you know, recognition, maybe some accolades for your work. Um, what do these accolades, recognition, nods, what do they truly mean to you? Um, I mean, I have a list of, of goals in, in mind uh, that keep me motivated. These accolades are, are great and they, they, they say that people are, they show that people are paying attention to what we're trying to do. Um, but ultimately, you know, fashion isn't like sports where there are, uh, you know, there are awards. You, top, you score the most goals, there's the trophy. You win the Champions League, you get, you know, your medals and everything. So fashion is, for me, uh, a couple of months ago, I dressed some of my, my little brother's friends for prom. And, you know, that was, that was a great moment for me, seeing these kids grow up and then suddenly they say, oh, I, I'm only going to prom if I'm wearing House of Tayo. You know, that, that means a lot to me. And so when I get to see that culture shift towards uh, more people wearing more brands, consuming African uh, products, that, that's what really keeps me going. That's what really gets me excited. All right. So um, it's clear that um, human resources is a critical element yes. to consider yes. when building any enterprise. Yes. Uh, how do you typically hire? Um, there are a couple of key elements that I, I look for. Um, I look for honesty. I look for people who can... Uh, who I look for confidence as well, you know. Sometimes I might make a wrong decision. I need you to confidently back why you are telling me, uh, why you're giving me a certain reason or why you're making a certain statement. Those are the, the key elements. I think that I never studied fashion, but there are things that I learned along the way. If you have some of the key elements um, in just in your personality, we can teach the other parts. All right, so how would you describe your leadership style? Um, I would say I lead, lead by example, um, for sure. Uh, I feel that it's a bit hypocritical to, to, to ask something of someone if you're not able to give to or show that level of commitment. And um, I, it has to really come from within, so I explain to my, my staff that we need to have excellence from, let's say, the cleaner all the way to the top. All right, so tell me about your flaws and feelings as a leader. Yeah, I would say um, I was a bit too nice. I could see maybe it, I took too, too long to let go of some staff. Um, you know, I kept trying to see You'd give them the benefit of the doubt, or you know what, maybe if we try to give them this, then we'll fix it, and, it, and in certain situations, it's, it's really cost the business. Um, but I think that I'm very self-aware, so even as I hire, I hire people who fill those voids. Yeah. Okay, so um, what would you say are those key skill sets 
um, that a CEO needs to acquire in managing people? A CEO needs to be able to get the best out of their available resources, and that includes the team. That only happens when you pay attention to, to what they say, what they do, and um, if you now take in that information and analyze it, try something else, see how they respond, react to that. And you have to keep doing that until you figured out how your team works. Amazing. Now, what would you say are those values uh, that are important to you and your firm? Uh, I would say that um, for here at House of Tayo, we want to bring out we want to bring out the person's personality. So, if you are someone who is, uh, I guess, more conservative, we will give you a tiny bit of flavor, but that matches you. Now, we're not going to put you in in a bright yellow and orange shirt, you know, we'll get, you know, you know something that's like navy blue, um, that has some few accents that fits you, that flatters you. We want to bring out the personality. Okay. Yeah. So what would you say is the biggest letdown um, you've experienced in business so far? Oh, wow, there's so many. I think one of the first ones was I was in, a, on an, in an entrepreneurship competition in 2013. And my view was that, you know, win this money and this is what takes the brand to that next level. And um, I was, the, my business, House of Tire, was the only business with an actual product at that time. And the judges just didn't seem to get it. You know, they didn't foresee um, the growth of African fashion. A couple of weeks after that, I, I moved back to, to Rwanda there's another competition, and already I was, I had the rug pulled under my, my, my feet. I started to doubt whether this fashion thing was going to work. I entered another competition, gave the best pitch, still runner-up, no cash prize. So it was, at that point, I really uh, doubted myself. And um, I didn't know whether my business was going to, to get off the ground. And so I was really excited. Actually, yesterday, um, got my first award from an entrepreneurship competition. Amazing. And, yes. Uh, and the, throughout the whole process, I was like hesitating. I was like, <laughs> I was like it's going to be deja vu. Um, but you know, we, it, it happened. And so I would say that those back-to-back -back losses really could almost jeopardize the company because I didn't think that um, it would work out. From being denied cash injection to his business through entrepreneurship competitions to actually winning entrepreneurship awards, Matthew believes in having the ability to change direction when a certain path seems to lead nowhere. However, we need to know the direction of his lifestyle choices. So I have a few quick fire questions for you. What do you love to eat? Rice. How would you describe your fashion style? A spontaneous. Your favorite brand to wear? <laughs> <Have some time. laughs> All right, tell me, so what other CEOs do you look up to? Um, CEO of LVMH. Bernard Arnault, um, seeing luxury, the luxury, um, I guess, industry is the only one that didn't see a slump even during the economic downturn. Mm -hmm. I, I watched a couple of his documentaries and he talks about selling luxury. And it showed me that, that uh, there are still people a huge number of people who appreciate craftsmanship, um, detail, and um, the delivering of like a high quality service. So he's, he's what I aspire to. And he also builds a lifestyle. So he's telling you, you go to the, you go to the club in a Christian Dior suit, mm -hmm. you drink champagne from his company, you draw order some Hennessy from his company, he sells you whole package lifestyle mm -hmm. and so we're trying to sell a lifestyle too. 
All right. Uh, what's your favorite car to drive? I would say Benz. All right. Favorite travel destination? Morocco. All right. Um, what book are you reading right now? I just read Shoe Dog by uh, Phil, Knight. Phil Knight. Yeah. Amazing book. Yeah. Huh? I'm a runner too, so that was <laughs> like perfect. I, I felt like you were telling me my life story. All right. So what's your favorite uh, book of all time? At this moment, you dog. <laughs> Still. Yes. All right. So lastly, I'd like to know, uh, Matthew, what makes you happy? Seeing people enjoy themselves. That makes me happy. All right. Thank you for coming on Under 40 CEOs, Matthew. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Good. Hi, my name is Matthew Tyrogamba, and you too can be an Under 40 CEO.